This is the Rich Dad Stockcast with Andy Tanner, the show that kicks 401ks in the asphalt and teaches you to be the master of your own stock investing domain. And here's your host, Greg Arthur. All right, welcome to the show. This show is going to start with a little lesson from Robert Kiyosaki. Um, I work with Robert daily and day in, day out, he's pounding me on how the value of the dollar is taking a nosedive. Inflation is going to go sky high. And so his strategy is to get in as much debt as possible. So I figured, hey, this guy's way, way smarter than me. I don't know crap. So I talked to my wife and we go out and we get in as much debt as possible. Like, like terrifying debt, like everything <laughs> I can do debt. So I'm pretty excited because Robert knows his stuff. I'm dumb. All I got to do is follow the smart guy. And then uh, a funny thing happens. Just a day or two ago, the Fed announces they're going to start jacking up their interest rates. So what that means is debt sucks. That's the <laughs> worst thing you could have. So now I'm in a, a bit of a panic. Uh, so I've asked Andy to explain four things because I know there's correlations. And like I said, I'm dumb. I can't figure this out. And so I want to know what this means to the stock market in general. I want to, I kind of want to get an idea of Bitcoin. I'm not saying I put some money in Bitcoin, but I might have um, how that works with the dollar and, uh, and gold, because I know they're all relationary and um, yeah, I, I need a, I need a, a little help here, Andy. And I, I need to know where to put my next dollar I make. I don't know if I'm supposed to well, hold you know. on to it. <laughs> well, you know how I am about advice, man. I never follow anybody. I do my own thing. So, yeah, well, but it's, I'm, it's I'm a, a fascinating guy. time to talk about all of those things, the fed, the dollar, gold, Bitcoin stocks. Um, first of all, I think you're right on track with keeping your eye on the fed right now, because there's been what I would call a, a severe detachment from what we would say corporate fundamentals. Now, what does that mean? That's a bunch of jargon. What that means is, is generally in the stock market, we would look at a company the same way we'd look at a piece of commercial real estate. You know, retail real estate, residential real estate is priced based on what your neighbors paid, right? right. I go into a community and I say, well, how much are the houses that are comparable going for? Uh, what's the supply and demand there? But really, when it comes to commercial real estate, a bank will say, well, how much money are most people making? You know, it's called a cap rate. What's our rate of return on the capital we put in? Um, you know, that's going to be based on it. They look at, you know, it's operating income and net that out. And they come up with uh, a number they think you should be making and they'll give you a loan. And that's kind of how stocks should be. We should look at a business and say, well, what's everybody else paying for this business? No, we should say uh, how much money they're making. But we're kind of going to the former. We're kind of looking around and saying, well, what's everyone else paying? Maybe I'll pay a little more. And so we've had a detachment from actual earnings from companies and the amount of money and debt that's available you know, for capital gives people buying power. You know, when you can borrow money, you can buy things. And uh, there's so much money finding its way into the purchase of stocks um, that, it, that it's astounding. I mean, we're sitting here, at, you know, bumping off of all time highs uh, here in the market. And a lot of that's because of the Fed's accommodative policy. So you're right on track, in my opinion, if a person says, look, it's about the Fed right now. It's about the Federal Reserve Bank and, and central banks around the world. They've really taken over, uh, you know, everything, essentially, and and it really has come down, in my opinion, to are you going to have inflation or deflation, and that's that's the biggest thing I'm teaching and and harping on right now is there's two forces. Picture these as opposed like an arm wrestle almost, where you have, <coughs> excuse me, deflationary forces which are huge. And therefore, we have inflationary prop-up forces that are artificial that are huge. Okay, can I interrupt you? Please. So the Fed jacking up the interest rates, that's deflationary. Correct? It is. It is. And, and the scary thing about it is 
you know, they're in a, in my opinion, I don't know if Jerome Powell feels this way. He always acts calm. He always acts like there's nothing wrong. But in my opinion, if the Fed were to remove their accommodative policy and go back to what we were, say, pre-2008 crash, or even, you know, pre-internet crash, uh, you know, any type of 4 or 5% rate would just kill us. I mean, it was just, it's, there's so much deflationary forces. So what is a deflationary force? Unemployment is deflationary because there's a scarcity of dollars, right? Uh, no one's making any money because so many people are unemployed. So in that way, COVID is deflationary, right? Cost a lot of jobs. Um, you know, a, a, a lower GDP, a recession is deflationary, right? So, yeah, let me, let me just clarify from my own head here. When it's deflationary, that means money is being taken out of the market. That's right. That's so right. Then a dollar you have more less value. of an abundance. That's right. I mean, if you think about it very simply, if we were to simplify this, the more valuable a dollar is, the further it will go. Right? I mean, if, if we were trading not dollars, we were back in the days of barter, and you know, we're, we've got bacon and eggs, and you've got a hog farm, and I've got a chicken ranch, uh, we can have breakfast together, two strips of bacon, two eggs. Question is what's worth more. So if all of a sudden there's a scarcity of eggs, well, then two eggs will buy four strips of bacon. But if there's an abundance of eggs and hardly any bacon, um, you know, it, 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 it might be a lot more, you know, a lot more the other way around. So as the dollar reduces its value, things cost more. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're not going to take as many dollars in exchange. You're going to, are you going to want more dollars in exchange? They're not worth as much, right? Right, right. So instead of saying, yeah, that's a good trade for five bucks, it says, no, your dollar's not worth it. I need 10 or I need 20 or I need 50. That's inflation. That's inflation. And the opposite is deflation. If the dollar becomes very scarce and very valuable and very hard to come by, people are going to clutch those dollars tight and say, hey, will you buy the apple from me? No, I won't buy the apple. It's too expensive. Well, I'll cut the price in half. No, still too expensive. My dollars are too precious. All right, I'll cut it by 70%. Oh, okay, I'll give you one of my dollars. So it's about abundance of money. And, and if you look at two things, you look at the ability to acquire it through work. That's one way to acquire money. So if we have full, un full employment, everyone's got a job, money's plentiful. And if you have easy credit. So you either work for the money or you borrow it easy. So the easier it is to borrow, that, that, that's going to create an abundance of money. And the easier it is to work and earn it, that's going to create an abundance of money. And those are inflationary forces. If that makes sense, prices are going to go higher because there's so much money around. Well, the Fed did it. We talked about this a little bit, I think, last podcast. I do so many, I can't remember what, what I've talked about, what I haven't. But, but the Fed made a move in the repo market, which is short-term loans. Not the discount rate, but the short-term you know, repurchasing agreements. They took it from zero to 0.05%. Well, everyone that, that had borrowed money from the Fed that was just you know, rolling it every day in these loans and rolling it said, we're not going to roll it. We can't take money we were borrowing at zero to go make money during the day with and then repay it at 5%. Uh, we don't make that much. So they gave all that money back to the Fed, a bunch of it, $750 billion worth, three quarters of a trillion dollars pulled out of the economy in one day. That's going to drop your gold by 4%. That's going to drop your stock a little bit. Um, so that so a raise of interest rates is deflationary. Now, wait, wait, wait. So, from what I heard, a raise of interest rates will lower the price of stock. Yeah, the, lower the price uh, of gold. Interest rates going higher, as a rule, hurts the stock market um, because there's le it's deflationary, right? It it puts down. It hurts gold because it's deflationary. It helps the dollar. Uh, because it makes dollars harder to come by. Look, the higher the interest rate is, the harder it is to get a loan, right? The harder dollars are to come by. Right. So any raise in interest rate makes money scarce, 
which is deflationary, right? We want to hang on to those dollars more when we can't get them as easy. So this hike in interest rates hurts everything. Um, Bitcoin, gold, stocks, but strengthens the dollar. It strengthens the dollar and it helps the savers and it helps uh, consumers because prices go down. So when Robert says savers are losers, he's talking about in a world of inflation. inflation. Okay. Yeah, debt kills you. Debt is awesome if you have inflation. Debt really hurts if you have deflation. Now, here's the thing, though. This is an arm wrestle, okay? So we're watching Sylvester Stallone and over the top. He's got his baseball hat on backwards. Worst movie probably ever made. And this arm wrestling is going back and forth because the forces are so strong. So if you take a little juice out of the Fed's bicep, it's going to tip towards deflation a little bit. If you put more juice into the Fed's bicep, it's going to push back against deflation. And the problem I think that the Fed has, and this is just an opinion, is that the Fed is, it's, they're like trying to build a piano with a chainsaw right now. You know, anytime they start that chainsaw up, they're cutting off a leg instead of putting in trim, right? Uh, They're, they don't have real fine tools. Here's the example. You raise the repo rate by, uh, 0.05%. Just, to, I mean, that's like a five hundredths of 1% or whatever it is, half of 1%. And uh, whatever the math is, but it's less than a percent, right? And you pull, you know, 700, you know, three quarters of a trillion dollars out of the market and gold, everyone around the world lost 4% of their gold wealth. That's a lot in one day. That's a lot. So if they threaten to raise interest rates, Ben Bernanke gave a speech way back before he was Fed chairman. He was a governor of a, of a central bank, not, the, pre, not the, the, the Fed chair. And it's probably the speech, speech that got him the job. And he said, look, like gold, uh, dollars are valuable only to the extent they're limited in supply. But we have a technology called a printing press, an electronics equivalent that allows us to print essentially as many dollars as we want at no cost. As a result, we can manipulate and in, this can be an increase or decrease in the price of goods or, or services. And what Ben Bernanke is really saying right there is that he said, we can do it by printing money or by, quote, credibly threatening to do so, unquote. So that's what the Jerome Paul has done is he says, look, we're going to threaten to raise rates in 2023. That's two years away. So that's not, you know, okay, that's what you're saying you do. Well, how many Fed meetings are between now and 2023 where they say, you know, based on what we're seeing today, uh, we're going to change our policy. I mean, I can show you Fed chair minutes from last time where he said, we think we're going to have accommodative policy for the next two years, right? Now he's changing it. So I don't, I'll take what he does at greater value than what he says, just like most people. Look at what they do, not what they say. My feeling is, is that Robert is correct, that, that they, they can talk about raising rates, but when they actually do it, and, and the deflationary forces start to kick their butt, you know, they start losing that arm wrestle. It seems to me that they, they're totally committed to stopping deflation, totally committed to it. He set a target rate of 2% inflation a year. That's the Fed's goal. Uh, he said, well, we might overshoot that a little, you know, we might undershoot it, but we're going to keep it around there. Well, you know, New York Times came out and said last year, it was like 5% on a lot of stuff. So they've more than doubled their goal. Whoops, whoops, so I didn't fix that. When you tweak it this much, down it goes. So I think there's so much deflationary force that, that they have no choice but to keep accommodative policy. And I think the reason Robert believes, you'd have to ask him, but I think the reason Robert believes we're gonna hyperinflate is there are limits to the amount of steroids we can put in the Fed's bicep. Look, you take rates to zero. Once you start going negative rates, that just gets weird and funky. And people can borrow, but even at zero, they can only borrow so much. I mean, if you had a zero down, uh, no doc, you know, in, no interest loan, you'd still have to pay back the principal. Right. 
So it isn't like there's this unlimited, you know, ability to, to do it. Um, they're talking about UBI, which would, you know, flush money in and be inflationary. Well, you'd only do so much of that. Um, that money's got to come through somewhere. Essentially, it's borrowed and given away and printed. So that is inflationary. If they, if they kill all these things, the deflation just takes over. It just, it just kills everything. And then you're in 1929. So they have, they have, think about it. How many years have we had pretty much interest rates at zero now? It's kind of the new norm. It's kind of like people have built their business based on a model of zero interest rate. You bump it up a little bit. You pull three, I mean, in the repo market, you pull three quarters of a trillion dollars out in a day. That means that, that means whatever they were using that money they borrowed at 0% for isn't, a, isn't profitable at point, you know, at 0.05%. And so they, they gave them the money back says we, our business models don't work uh, at that rate. We got to give you the money back or we'll lose. So it, it, there's such a fine line and such a, we're so accustomed to accommodative policy that, that the slightest tweak is just killing, you know, it's tough. Well, I think uh, when they just mentioned that in 2023, that they would do this, I heard that the stock market itself went down it had like a little blip. Yeah. yeah not much i mean it it i think when did they say that last um when was, was it was, like on the 18th or something it. like that you know yeah we didn't even get down to support on that we didn't even get to really a level of support in fact it was started at a higher level of support on that so they can talk about it but as long as they say oh okay great we got a couple of years good you know um I mean, right now the stock market's sitting close to an all. Yesterday was an all-time high. So, um, you know, the interesting one is Bitcoin because it's all over the place. Yeah. And the problem with Bitcoin is, you know, I I have some Bitcoin. Robert loves Bitcoin. I have it. You know, I think I think Robert buys it with enthusiasm. I buy it with my arm behind my back, feeling like I have to because it's a thing. Right. And because I don't know enough about it to hate it more than I do. So I, I don't like it because it's man-made, you know, just like what's the difference between Bitcoin and a dollar, but we're both man-made. And I, I, I think the dollar is backed by governments with huge amounts of guns and weapons and the ability to enforce laws. And Bitcoin's not backed by anything. Um, it's just kind of a, blockchain technology, a ledger that everyone verifies. It's a neat idea, but the idea it can overtake the Fed? No, I, I, I think the United States military is stronger than Bitcoin. I think if, if they come out and say, we're going to tax Bitcoin at 30%, or we don't take Bitcoin in payment for taxes, you got to get dollars. You ain't got to cash in your Bitcoin for dollars anyway. So as long as the law, as long as they can tax you, um, the dollar's backed by taxation. It's not backed by gold anymore. It's backed by the ability to throw you in jail. That's MMT. It's a loss of freedom is what it is. I'm not a fan of the dollar either. I want my freedom, but it's being taken from us for sure. Uh, taxation, look, what's freedom? It's the amount of stuff you get to keep without the king taking it all, right? So you might measure your freedom by the amount of hard work and how much stuff of yours gets to be yours that they don't say, up. Oh, 10% more, up oh, 20% more, up oh, 30% more. So it's an interesting time. You know, it's a time to be smart. Um, it's not a time for advice because everyone's got different advice. It's time to learn and make your own decisions. Uh, that's the only advice I have is don't <laughs> take advice. <laughs> so so wait, if, if I was going to summarize, if I'm going to summarize this, as the dollar's as we get inflation, the dollar's value goes down. So then Bitcoin, gold, and the stock market are really all in step. They're, they're following the same curve against the dollar. Yeah, the, 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 the dollar is inversely correlated to the stock market right now. Um, the dollar is inversely correlated to gold. Bitcoin is now all over the place. Bitcoin is now inversely correlated to gold. Oddly enough, it should be in lockstep with it. So Bitcoin, I just kind of say that's new and crazy and volatile, but it, it's, it follows those patterns. Look, if the Fed is accommodative, dollar goes down. And you also have to look at the dollar relative to other currencies, right? 
I mean, if I was in a, in a handsomeness contest, uh, how would you judge that? For me to win it, there'd have to be some scary looking people in there. And that's kind of how the dollar is, right? The dollar is probably not as bad as, you know, so what, you want to go, you know, trade in, you know, Russian rubles right now, or you want to go, you know, you want to trade in Quan. So it's kind of like relative to how nasty the other, the other countries are. A better way to look at it is what's the dollar opposed to gold or what's the dollar opposed to stock or what's the dollar opposed to another asset uh, rather than opposed to another currency. So it's a little tricky uh, to watch it. But, but we do know this. If there's an abundance of dollars, its value is less. They're right. easy to get and borrow. If they're hard to get and borrow and hard to earn, the dollar value goes up. Think, so think, still- about, think about the depression, 1929. Money's nowhere. Everyone's unemployed. So you can go to the grocery store. You just have no money to buy the apples, right? Right, right? Hyperinflation, everyone's buying the apples because they think tomorrow they won't be able to buy them because they'll be too expensive. So the stores are empty. But either way, no one's eating. <laughs> but that's what I did. In my opinion, I got as much debt because I believe in the inflation. And so I believe yeah. if I don't buy things now, tomorrow they're going to be more expensive. So I might as yeah. well get in now as low taken- price as I can. You know, I've taken an approach with my mind of a combination of Warren Buffett and Robert Kiyosaki. I, I think that the key is cash flow. Because if you maintain cash flow, uh, you're always accumulating. It's always coming towards me, right? I have things that are cash flowing. So that's the financial statement on the income and expense side, that I have more money inflowing in from investments that I've outflowing. The gold se- section and the Bitcoin is, is that doesn't cash flow at all. And, and stocks thought about the wrong way and real estate thought about the wrong way are net worth. So you say, oh, real estate's going up, gold's going up, stocks going up. That's not how I think about it. Um, I want stability in my net worth growing slightly because of cash flow, but I'm not going to put all my bets on net worth balance sheet type stuff, hoping one goes up, one goes down because I don't know what's going to happen. And because I don't know what's going to happen, I lean towards cash flow. Warren Buffett, I think, as I look at his financial statement, he wants the balance sheet to balance and wants stability in his net worth because it's the assets that produce the cash flow. So if I lose all my net worth, I can't buy any assets, I can't get any debt, uh, and my cash flow goes away. So he's got billions and billions and billions of dollars in companies he holds called stocks and companies. He's also got billions and billions and billions of dollars in cash. He's probably got some debt as well. So if, if, if debt turns out to be awesome with inflation and his dollars suck, well, there's still a balance there. If we have depression and his dollars are awesome and his debt sucks, then he's still balanced there. And that's kind of the approach I've taken, leaning towards the inflation side. Because uh, I think Robert's right. I think eventually, um, I think eventually that that the inflation will overtake, that the Fed will run out of steroids to put in their arm or the arm quits working. And that's when uh, you just have massive inflation and then boom, a huge deflation right after. So you kind of struggling, struggling, inflation, deflation, that quick. And so I, I think for me, I just try to prepare for both. It's, it's less about, I think we have too much prediction right now. Oh, I think we're going to have inflation. Oh, I think we're going to have deflation. Well, both forces are there. Either one can happen. Who wins, the Fed or the, or the environment? I'm, I'm just preparing for both. All right. So while I'm watching the Fed, what you're doing is you're creating cash flowing investments so that no matter which way it goes, you're coming out ahead. I'm hoping. I mean, I can't say. Right. I know you, know, you never give out. I've never but. traded like I, and I'm doing a lot of hedging as well. Uh, I'm buying a lot of insurance. For example, I, I am going totally against the market right now in terms of commodities. Here's an interesting thing. The market, what they call the smart money, isn't always that smart. The smart money was Bear Stearns, right? The smart money was Lehman and Robert Kiyosaki called them out on CNN and said, they're going down. They're not smart. But the smart money is generally what the big guys are seeing and doing. So there's this thing called a futures contract. 
And what a futures contract does is it lets me buy something in the future. It's not an option contract. I'm committed. I have no choice. I have to liquidate it or take delivery or deliver, one of the three. And so, for example, if you look at the price of corn, uh, right now you're paying twice as much for corn now as you would pay two years from now, somewhere around in there, not quite twice. So you can actually lock up your price of corn cheap two years from now. Now, the reason I know I'm in the uh, minority on this is there's not too many people buying it out that far. There's very small open interest. And the fact that people are willing to sell their corn two years from now so cheap, it means that the people growing it think that uh, prices are going to fall, right? The, 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 the people And the people buying it think prices are going to fall because they won't pay more. So the smart money, so, so to speak, the, the big money, believes this inflation is what we call transitory, that it's simply, uh, you know, kind of getting through COVID and, and, you know, money starting to come back again. And so prices are going up and supply chains are kind of, you know, plywood is expensive because there's no supply chains. I don't know. I looked at Home Depot, they got 2000, you know, bucks of plywood sitting there. So at $50 a sheet. So I don't know. Um, I, I, so what did I say? Greg, I said, I'm going to buy some options on some futures and some, some indexes like consumer staples. I'm going to buy some leaps on those. And I'm going to look at his insurance. I, I hope I lose the money. I hope I lose the money. Because if I lose the money, that means we had no inflation. And uh, it's the same feeling I have with insuring my homes or my cars or my health. Hey, I spend that money to protect and if I go this year without using my fire insurance, I'm happy. I'm still here. So I have been preparing for inflation by buying, by some people do it with debt. Debt, you got to pay off me. I just spent money. And if it grows, great. And if I lose it, great. But it's fixed that way. See, it's fixed. Gotcha. And I can only lose the premium I paid for an option on a future or an option on, a, on an index like consumer staples. All right, I'm going to I'm going to end the show cuz we're getting yeah, past, past my intelligence again. Uh I always like to give you a little plug, but you talked about the value of cash flowing as a strategy because it helps you either way it goes generally. I'm we're hoping giving you an so. absolute. Yeah, no you guarantees. Teach, you teach that in your course. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough, Greg, because people are freaking lazy. Can I just get everyone mad at me? No, tell me what to do. Like it pisses me off because a policeman has to go to school. A doctor has to go to school. Any legitimate job that, ha that you know, you got to use your head in has training for it. And yet people can get on Robin Hood after looking at Reddit for 10 minutes and think they can be, you know, George Soros as a traitor. And so if I go over people's head, they say, well, I just want to be told what to do. That's laziness. Right. I don't want to make my bed. I don't want to mow my, I just I, tell me what to do and just tell me what button to push. That's lazy and lazy people don't make money. Okay, so so I, back, I'm back on my education, <laughs> I'm on my education bandwagon because if you don't understand the stuff I'm saying, study, and then you don't have to worry about other people's. Well, advice. and that's where I'm getting like, I know in your course, you teach options. Does yeah. it go so far as to teach these leaps in the futures and everything I've spoken about today, a person could learn how to do my four pillars, four, four pillars class about 20 hours to go through it. And if you can buy an option, I mean, you can buy an option on a stock or you can buy an option on a future. It's the same principles. Okay. There's a strike, there's an expiration, you know, there's a premium to pay, but your maximum risk is your premium paid. So, you know, the most you can lose up front. And it's tiny. Like, think about insurance, Greg. How much do you think you paid in home insurance over the past 12 months on your home? Uh, whatever my wife wrote the check for. Yeah, so it's probably thousands of dollars, right? All but right. you're insuring a million-dollar home. Right, so right. That, well, it's the same with what I'm doing. I'm spending, a, you know, 1000 here, 10000 here, you know, whatever. But it's insuring massive amounts of money. And I'm happy to lose the small amount of money and sleep better at night the same way, the same way I'll pay a little car insurance, hoping I lose the money and that I don't wreck. So that's how I'm preparing for, for inflation. And I think Robert's right. I think that's the arm wrestle that'll win. Uh, I just know from an investing standpoint, I've learned 
to prepare for both scenarios. Robert always asks me, Andy, do you think the market's going to go up or down? I say, I, and he knows my answer. He's asked me a thousand times. So he kind of throws the softball at me, but he, he says, you think markets are going to go up or down? I says, I don't care. And I don't know. I'm just preparing for both all the time, hedging for one side, hedging for the other, you know, getting things balanced. So I'm protected. All right. So we're going to end it here. Yeah. We're going to do a short if one. If people want to know how to protect Texas themselves. For vacation. We got to do a short one here. You all tanned up. Yeah. You're supposed to go easy on me. My brain's fried. All right. Take Andy's course. <laughs> you'll get, you'll understand this hedging and this option. Um, if you'd like to, before you even take Andy's course uh, in the show notes, there's some free training Andy gives. Yeah. Uh, you can see a webinar where he maps it all out, draws it up and explains it with his whiteboards and all that, and good, all that stuff. good stuff. So, so I highly recommend you give Andy a try. Um, <laughs> he'll, he'll explain options very, very well. And uh, to get a little deeper into it, I, I highly recommend his course. So hey, Andy, thanks for the weekly plug there, buddy. I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, I, I mean it though. People and in all seriousness, whether people learn from me or learn from someone or whoever, learn from somebody. I, I just tell you, it's tough to put the seatbelt on in the middle of the traffic accident. And we have five trillion dollars that we've printed. You know, you move it this much, three quarters of a trillion comes out. I mean, it's just crazy instruments that they use. And they, I think they're limited in their power. So you'll learn about the Fed, you'll learn about monetary policy and uh, what you can do to, to do your best to protect yourself and, and possibly profit. All right, well, thank you, Andy, once again. All right, talk to you next week. Thanks, Greg, we'll right. see you. Bye.